Last week, we were talking about uh, Chanel and Rose Vallon, and in general, talking about um, the choices that people make uh, in times of crisis. And you know, what inspired me was you know, the way in which people behaved during COVID. And then we looked at a more extreme example of this, which is, of course, the occupation of Paris. And um, I'll be talking much more about the occupation of Paris uh, today and the sort of history behind it. So it's a much more theoretical sort of lecture in some ways than, than, than others. Now, what we were talking about really with those other two ladies and what we're going to be talking about today um, is that some people make ethical and some people make what we considered unethical um, uh, decisions. And we're not really looking at whether they're good or bad people because we can't judge how it would be like to live in those circumstances. But what is of interest to us is the way in which their um, lives have become part of the national narrative. Uh, and how parts of their lives have been emphasised, other parts have been obscured, um, basically um, for um, a kind of national legend or myth uh, which has been established. And in this case, we saw that very much with Chanel uh, and the way in which uh, General de Gaulle at the end of the war um, made the decision that um, everybody had been resistors and therefore, you know, the French who the French who liberated the French. I mean, that's really a stretch of the uh, everyone's not just imagination, but you know, um, he he actually then sort of is the person who will drive forward um, this idea of France having emerged victorious um, at the time. And what we're going to look at today are um, three other women too of whom um, collaborated extensively, um, and I'm very sorry, Elaine, um, Piaf was one of them. Um, uh, Arletti, who became the star um, of the French cinema. In fact, it was the golden age of French cinema um, during the occupation, and we'll see why. And one woman who wasn't glamorous at all, but falls uh, through this sort of net as the abortionist, um, Marie-Louise Giraud, if you can call her that. Um, so what I find fascinating is that during a time when you've got theoretically people, you know, fighting good, there's good against evil in many ways, you know, with the French undergoing this occupation of, of the Nazis, um, they glorify in many ways the people or after the war, they then glorify the people who sided with what they considered evil at the time. So um, this is sort of something that I want to in investigate, and also the hypocrisy um, inherent in the way in which these three women um, are treated, particularly the, the woman in the middle. You can see she's not going to come out very well, can't you? She's a bit of a front. Uh, and the others, of course, you know, are part of showbiz, you know, and this is part of, you know, the French, you know, joie de vivre, gay Paris, French creative genius, and so on. Now, let's just hope this works. Um, before we get into that, um, I want to just quickly look at uh, what happened in the occupation of Paris. This is very, very brief, right? Probably Wikipedia would do it better than this. But I just want to look actually at um, 1940, uh, when the Germans uh, sweep through uh, the Low Countries past the Maginot Line, and I think within six weeks have gone through the Lowlands and have actually gone through France and taken Paris and then down to the Loire. The Germans are actually surprised at the extraordinary um, ease with which they take over France and the surrender of the French army and even watching some of the French soldiers dancing a jig because they're so happy they don't have to fight to the absolute consternation of the, um, uh, the um, German uh, soldiers. At this time, uh, Hitler, as you know, who saw himself as an artist, um, in his mind was utterly entranced by the myth of, of Paris and he had never been and he flies in, um, I can't remember the date, with Svea, who is his architect, and does a, 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 a stop, you know, hot stop 
visit of all the main monuments of Paris. He goes to the opera, gets a garden tour of the opera, goes to the, has a, a photo opportunity at the Arc at the um, Eiffel Tower, and goes and sort of um, quite spends quite some time pondering over to Napoleon, um, who he sees also as the great conqueror of Europe. Now he had this, not just, we wouldn't call it a soft spot for Paris, but Paris for him is already a kind of, myth, myth, you know, legendary place. And by taking over Paris, um, it means that he has taken over what he considered in many ways, the sort of cultural center of Europe. So it had great significance uh, for him. And he wanted to keep Paris the way it was. It's a kind of Disneyland, right? He didn't, he did not want to destroy it, you know, um, as the, the um, Germans would bomb other cities. Um, Paris emerges basically unscathed. You do have to think of that in context of what we're saying. All the monuments still stand. Uh, and he wanted that to be a kind of a showcase for um, one of the sort of culture of the new sort of German, you know, Reich of the German Empire. And it would be um, the template for other cultural cities that he would develop. But he didn't like the dynamism of it. It was going to be something which was frozen in time, very much like a Disneyland. But he wanted all his German soldiers to go and visit it. When they were on leave, they were to go and visit and experience Paris. Now, this was at the beginning of the war. Um, this was in 1940. Um, his soldiers were instructed to be extremely polite. They were always to have their uniforms, you know, beautifully sort of turned out, they were to be polite to old people, young people, to hand, hand out sweets and so on, uh, and to not aggravate um, the people of Paris. And the people of Paris seemed to actually, uh, you know, decide that this was fine. And what I'm coming up to is that there is this huge sense after the war of utter humiliation of the French when they actually realised that they really in no way sort of resisted um, the Germans. Uh, and in fact, this that they build up the whole idea of the French resistance with a capital R and then with a small R. And you get these entire sort of history books which are still being read, trying to define, you know, what actually did resistance mean? Did it actually mean not cooperation or did it mean just sort of getting on with your life? Did it mean actively um, resisting? What exactly did it mean? And in fact, there's been studies to say that, in fact, there was something like 1% of the population who were active resistors. And they happened to mainly be people from the Communist Party, Protestants and Jews. All right? In other words, people who were already slightly marginalised from Roman Catholic France. Right? Um, and in fact, the French resistance was totally disorganised um, in small groups. Uh, and in fact, it was much less effective and much less numerous than places like, um, uh, like Poland or Hungary or these other small countries, even, even Italy, would you believe, um, had a, a slightly more active uh, resistance. So this is then um, the beginning of the occupation. Um, the uh, things start then as the war wears on and things start to gradually turn against the, uh, the uh, Germans, particularly when they start invading Russia. Um, all, most of the food that was being produced in France is actually being sent off to Germany. Uh, most of the Germans are now soldiers, therefore they need people to work in the factories. And so many of the French men go um, to work there. They're, in fact, they're forced to go and work there. Um, and life becomes more and more difficult. And it was also a time when there were very, very severe winters uh, as well. Um, and so as things become more difficult, you then have the implication of the same sorts of racial cleansing uh, that you had in Germany, the rounding up of the Jews. Um, and finally, when towards the very end of, well, in 1940, 43, 1942, 1943, when things are getting dire, the, the Germans can really no longer spare enough uh, soldiers 
to actually look after affairs in France. And so the French milice um, will take over and they are actually more ferocious uh, in their um, dealing with so-called resistors or resistors or the Jews or anyone else. And so what has, has really happened now is that you have the French who are the people who are deporting the Jews. You have the French who are torturing the resistance. And this is, is now proved. It's not just me standing here saying this. All right. And um, the French have not been able for a long time to acknowledge this. And so you know, when you think of all of the kind of propaganda that you have you know, in the sort of serials and things, there's always the French resistance there with his beret and everything. These people were very, very few on the ground. Um, these, uh, these were a special police which was set up you might actually be very interested to know that um, a prominent resistor, um, in fact, people actually right at the end of the war changed their, their colours um, from being in the Vichy government to becoming a resistor. And the very famous one of these is no other than uh, Francois Mitterrand, mm -hmm. who uh, had been um, actually a minister in the Vichy government. All right, now all of these things, I mean, whoever knew that, you know, it's in the story of Mitterrand, you know, we don't hear about that. Anyway, things become very dark. So, all right, now I want to now that what happens then from uh, Hitler actually wanting to preserve the city as it is um, when things have become very, very dire in 1944, he um, sends out the orders that France is, at least Paris, is to be defended. And if it cannot be defended, it is to be blown up totally blown up, mm -hmm. all right? So there's a real change um, in, in his attitude. Um, the, you know, the, the dynamite was supposed to be laid um, around Notre Dame and so on, but the person who he had in charge there had no intention of doing this college uh, and realised that it would be his own death sentence because the Allies were advancing. So Paris escaped by um, the skin of its teeth. So that's very briefly sort of what you're looking at. Now, what happens in 1940 is, of course, Hitler takes over and he uh, takes over France very easily and um, puts Marie-Charles Pétain, who was the sort of hero of World War I. And now, of course, he's in his 80s, um, but he was, you know, a revered figure, very right wing. Um, and there's something else that I actually really want to do all the time is for you to sort of reflect on um, these attitudes that we're talking about today uh, in, in during the war and actually what's happening at the French elections at the moment. This sort of um, virtually sort of half the country still always extremely right wing and exactly the same sort of um, demographic, you know, the sort of cast, and I'm sorry, I'm not saying if anyone's Catholic, it's not, that's not what I'm saying, but there's this mentality in, in France um, of, you know, the sacred nature of, of the, uh, the nation, uh, anti-immigrant, anti-Jew, anti-Islamic and so on. And, you know, basically 50% of the population um, will be voting with um, Marine Le Pen. So, you know, you have this all, almost the same paradigm. The Germans occupied um, the North. Uh, and there's this so-called free zone, um, which isn't free at all. It's under uh, Vichy, is headquartered at the town of Vichy, with Marichal Pétain in charge. Now, um, he is actually just a puppet of the Germans. Now, um, oh, come on. He sets up the Révolution Nationale, which is a ridiculous um, name for his government, which is an extraordinarily right-wing government. And we're going to be looking at the attitudes to the family and the attitudes to women and how this um, affects the, the lives of these three women. Now, here we have this poster, which was up absolutely everywhere. Uh, over here on the left, of course, you have uh, France, which is teetering. Uh, and in fact, it's red. That's because it's under you know, communist rule. And the House of France, as you can see, is collapsing. Um, there's the red flag of the uh, Communist Party and the Star of David, um, which are supposed to be the, one of the reasons why it's collapsing. You can see it's, you know, the, the grass has grown around it. And underneath, you've got the reasons um, what are pushing it over. 
you've got extraordinary things, um, adaptive points, such as, um, first of all, you've got um, the Jews, all right? You've got the Freemasons, that's the Freemasons and also the Protestants. And um, you have, what else? You've got the communists, so those are sort of ideology, but this also leads to alcoholism. You see, Cassis pour le vin. Then you actually have even de de um, democracy, actually, is really a bit of a problem as well. Um, <laughs> and this all sort of, sort of deals to anti militarism, all right? And instead of um, liberté, égalité, fraternité, you've got paresse, in other words, laziness, demagogy, and internationalism. All right. Mm -hmm. So um, all of these are things that are uh, destroying France. Now, he, under uh, Marie-Jean Pétain, with the stars of his marshal up on the, in the sky, you have France, which is really being put back the way it should be. It's all clean and dusted. Um, you have underneath the pillars, the pillars, which are the school, and Ecole, that means primary school basically as well. Um, artisanat probably means the like apprenticeships, people you know working in, in lowly things. The peasants, in other words, this is the deep France, the real France. And um, you also have Legion, um, the military. And this is all underpinned, you know, there's no, the, the idea of the Republic is completely gone and you've got, what have you got instead? You've got work, family, the homeland, right, Katri. Now, and that's the top, we've got a window, you've got a woman opening up the shutters for this perfect France. Now, what this was, <coughs> um, what Pétain was doing, um, it's a, was trying to turn back the clock to before the French Revolution. Um, he considered, and in fact, much of the right wing um, were had never got over the fact that the Front National had, had, had won, that you had the, the values of the Republic were dominant. Uh, and for Pétain and for this group, the, um, the values of the Republic were individualism. All right, and individualism led to just personal gratification. And this was something which was not to, to be tolerated. Um, it was the family which um, is, is important. Uh, and the rights of man really, uh, you know, if you consider yourself the son of the rights of man, it means you're an individual, you're not part of the whole group. Uh, and so this was something which was undermining the real France, which was, you know, the, the, the rural France, which still has such an appeal uh, to the right wing voters. So um, this is going to affect uh, very much um, the attitudes towards women, of course, with the family. And I have to talk in a moment about the sort of the problems or the, the, the uh, things that have haunted France and which still did until recently. So here you have, leave us alone. You know, you've got the, the real peasants, 1941. You've got Freemasons, Jews, de Gaulle, and this is um, lies, <laughs> false, fake news, all attacking the real France, right? And the real France, you know, the, that France profonde. Now, oh, this is painful. Um, also, this is also, it's all the, the fact that you had against Europe, you had uh, the Russians um, in cahoots with the English, and it's all a Jewish plot. I mean, it's really extremely um, disturbing. Now, uh, this meant that if you actually put the family at the center and there, there became there was a ministry now for the depopulation or the denatalisation of, of France. There was this absolute nightmare that the French felt that they were being outborn by every other by the dominant countries of Europe. And so women were to go back to their traditional role. And, and in fact, much of this idea of, of what had happened to France 
you know, with the degeneration of, of France, the degeneration of the ideal, the pursuit of individual pleasure, um, universal suffrage for men, not for women, um, uh, were, was the problem of women, really, because women had abandoned their role, and particularly during the First World War, a lot of women had actually gone out and worked in the armaments factories. So you had to get women back in the home, um, back producing children, um, and we'll come across this in, in, in a moment. Now, um, so this is, you can see, I mean, this is, this is what the walls of Paris looked like, you know, the new life, the, the, you know, the, the lights coming up over, over in the horizon. Then you've got Peter up there with the charter of work. So French women now, under the Vichy government, were not allowed to work in the, what's it called, the um, fonction public, uh, public service or anything to do with the public service. In other words, that's also teaching it or, or, or even in the hospital. So therefore you have women who have to go back um, into the foyer. Now these are, I just sort of thought these were, these are the sorts of things you would have seen um, on the walls of Paris. First of all, you've got now what kind of woman do you want to be? Well, first of all, you've got la femme coquette sans enfant, you know, this is, you know, flirty woman who has no children, who looks as though she's having a damn good time. <laughs> and she, there she is looking at herself, has no place in the city. She's absolutely useless. And what I'm going to sort of talk about is that, you know, you've got, on the one hand, you've got these posters on the walls of Paris, and you've got, you know, Arletti and Piaf, doing their thing at exactly the same time. No kids, no marriage, uh, both extramarital affairs and so on, because Vichy was, of course, against pornography. It was against um, uh, adultery, all of, all of these things. All right, on the other hand, you've got the useful woman, all right, so she can look after people. She knows how to bring people up. She knows how to educate people. Uh, what is she doing? How does she knows how much things cost, <laughs> and she knows real values. She serves, all right. So, in other words, this women were serving France, and they are the pillar um, of of France, the old traditional values of France. You know, it's no longer just something that you do, go home and have children. This is a kind of sacred mission which is going to save the homeland. All right, so this is the way in which this is put forward. Now, um, I want to just talk. Oh, no, no, now we'll go back. <laughs> you did. Let's try again. Um, France, um, after 1871, um, was haunted by the fact that they had been defeated uh, by the Prussians, but also um, during the sort of the time between 1871 and 1911, um, I think the German population had increased by something like 80%, which is huge, but admittedly it's because they uh, annexed different parts of Germany, whereas the French population had in, improved by 6%. Uh, and um, of course, don't forget that during the First World War, um, one and a half million Frenchmen died, four and a half million were um, wounded, and by the time that we're talking about, there were sort of 1.6 or something women um, to men. Um, so there was this real need, although they, they saw that France was going to be overtaken simply because it did not have enough uh, people, uh, or men in particular. And so there's going to be a, an active uh, sort of government which is going to reward people for having um, children and, of course, is going to uh, fiercely oppose um, abortion. Uh, and this is the, what we're going to talk about with uh, Marie-France uh, Giraud. So um, here we have the ideal woman, National Day of Mothers of a Large Family. This is Famille Nombreuse. 
and she's looking pretty good considering she's got <laughs> now one, two, three, four, five, mm. six. Now six that was considered okay. And even when I was in in France, um, if you had um, four children, you you had your taxes were lowered, and if you had the fifth, you were given extra taxes so that you could have a, a bigger car. Um, no, it was something that the French have worried about for a, for a long time. Um, and this is going to have a huge effect um, on um, the fact that women in France don't get the vote for such a long time, all right, because they are very much confined um, in this role um, as a sacred duty of, of, of bringing up children. So um, if you did the right thing, um, you, they actually, there was um, these certificates which were given to you by the Maréchal de France, and he poses as the kind of father. And here he is, he gives the bronze medal for the French family, it's given to Madame whatever it is um, on such and such a day. Now, bronze medal presumably was for four. I think probably maybe you got a silver for five, and then, and then on the top of the maybe six, so maybe seven. I don't, I don't know. I couldn't find this, but people were, you know, these were certificates on the wall um, for, um, you know, it wasn't just something that you you got from the thing. You were actually serving France. So your your mission was clear. And I thought this photograph um, was, was very good. Here she is. Which was, the children don't look all that happy, but you've got one, two, three, four, five. She's got seven, and she's pointing. Um, if she's still got the, the energy to point um, to um, this photo of uh, Marichelle Petta, you know, who, you know, we dedicate ourselves to um, the country to the repopulation of France, to the real France. Now, yes, it's quite amazing. Now, also, um, there had been already the Fête des Mères, the, there's a, a day dedicated to mothers, but um, in the 19, what it is, I can't see it, 1945, um, the day of mothers is set up. And so here you have three little kids with their, their flowers, 19, I mean, you know, what, where could you get flowers at this time? And there she is, um, mum's there with her last last child. So um, this um, public uh, thanking um, of women who have uh, children. Now, um, at the same time, there was this real, what did you do about people who didn't have children, all right? And so there are people who were, um, sort of, uh, who don't marry, all right, were considered suspicious, mainly because they might be, but they were considered as very selfish um, or possibly they were homosexual. Um, people who lived in a free union, they would be heavily sort of taxed as well. Uh, and then, of course, you have uh, women who um, aren't actually having enough babies or indeed, even worse, are uh, aborting them. And so here we have the child, the children are joy. Don't refuse your happiness by destroying life. Uh, don't ruin your health, risking death. So now it's become this extraordinary sort of struggle between life and death um, is, uh, you know, this basis of having children. And this is the National Alliance for the Vitality of France. Now, um, this there was already laws um, in, in France before the Vichy government, uh, even in the 1930s, um, if you were found to have committed an abortion, you were given five years uh, and a thousand franc, five years in prison and a thousand franc amount of uh, uh, fine. Um, and even, and the woman who had the abortion was also in prison for two years. Um, under the Vichy government, this became a, not just a crime, um, it was considered um, a crime against the country. And so it now um, brought with it the capital punishment. You know, you would be uh, executed for this sort of procedure. And here we have what I think is an extremely disturbing um, poster, which is, this comes from the, um, in the review of the uh, National Alliance Against Depopulation, 1939. Here, the, the, 
abortors kill one little French person in three. Um, those who pr protect these people betray France uh, and, and help the foreigners or, you know, the, the enemy, basically. So there you've got an avorteur uh, and a woman who's an avorteur, and then you get a traitor, the person who's actually, um, you know, possibly even put them up to it or could be a military traitor. And you've got these guns here and they're being you know, blindfolded and shot. It's an extremely um, disturbing image, but this is how important this idea of um, abortion became. So um, abortion then became a major crime and also it was not tried before the normal um, courts uh, with a jury because it was considered that the jury might be um, swayed by emotion because of the situation of the person who had done it. And so it was a judge or a panel of judges who would, and of course, who were men. Uh, uh, and the jury system was chucked out for abortion. So you can see how strong this was. I'm, I'm, this is going to be an awfully long lecture. All right, so we now get on to Marie-Louise Giraud, um, who uh, came from a very poor background. Uh, there's very few pictures of her. Um, there's very little that I can sort of visually bring up about her. Um, she married a sailor. Um, uh, he, I think it had gone off, either he was a prisoner, but he definitely wasn't uh, living uh, with her. And this was one of the great problems um, of, these, of these women, um, trying to make ends meet uh, during the war. Um, if their husbands were prisoners, they had to also send off packets of food and things because they weren't being fed properly, uh, loneliness and all the rest of it. Um, so she started out by renting, she had two children, um, renting out one of her rooms in Chambord to some prostitutes and uh, became friendly with them and um, performed her first abortion simply for a friend and then gradually realised that this could be a profitable trade uh, and carried out something like 27 abortions. It was hardly, you know, grand scale. Um, however, one of her ladies actually died. But um, before that happened, or after that happened, anyhow, she was denounced by one of these uh, people who, in fact, um, became very jealous of the fact that she'd gone from being a very, very poor woman to actually having um, a few bits and pieces of electric you know, appliances in her kitchen. Maybe she dressed a little bit better. It was a time when it was very, very difficult to sort of stay out of the snares of people who didn't like you. I mean, just you see what happens with trolls on the internet today or well, under the occupation, the trolls were people writing letters denouncing you. Uh, and unfortunately, um, you know, with just dire results. So she actually sort of set up a little business. She was charging 50 to 1,000 francs or something, which was a lot um, for an abortion. But people were absolutely desperate, eh, because... Um, it was clear that they would have been having an affair with someone else because the husband um, was gone, or they were having a, a relationship with a German, um, or they, you know, been forced into it by, by the Germans when they were desperate to get out of it. Um, anyhow, she set up a little business and she had these um, fortune tellers who, three fortune tellers who used women would go to, you know, see them to ask their fortune. And she'd say, well, look, you know, I know where you can go to get you out of this trouble. So she was denounced, um, as were the fortune tellers, and taken down to Paris, uh, where she uh, stood trial and um, was the, um, it was decided that she would be executed. Uh, in, she was in the prison of La Roquette, uh, which is just opposite, uh, no longer exists, but it's opposite um, Père Lachaise Cemetery, which is quite convenient, I suppose. Oh, wow. Now, this is um, her being, this is her execution. Um, she was taken out um, very early, uh, you know, guards around, uh, just in case people demonstrate against it. Uh, and this was taken out as an example of, you know, what cannot happen. You know, this is a crime against France. Um, the, she was uh, executed. The three voyant, according to their complicity, were given five, eight and ten years of, of prison as well. 
And I just wanted to show you the um, where the uh, you can still see where the guillotine is actually outside the walls of, of Belle Lachaise. So this was, it was an example um, of, of a woman who hadn't collaborated really with the Germans at all, but um, would be executed as an example uh, for others. Now, I want to go on to, hopefully, I want to go, oh, oh, that's her looking a little bit frazzled at the end. Now, um, a film has been made of this, um, if you want to actually see it. It's, um, oh yes, well, it's what happens about abortion. Um, abortion doesn't, is, is finally brought in by Simon Weil, who actually was deported, was Jewish and was deported um, to the death camps and the family all died and she survived and comes back and becomes one of the major magistrates in France and is she who pushes through the abortion law in 1975. Oh, and by the way, the death penalty in France was not abolished till 1981. Oh. It's very, and the last person who was executed by um, guillotine was 1977. It's, yeah, it's, uh, um, and uh, so this is the film in you know, the farm, but I think you can get it uh, with English subtitles. In fact, I'm sure you can because I've, I've seen it on TV with Isabelle Huppert. She, and of course, this is a role which is terrific for her. I now want to go on to Leonie that known as Arletti. I don't know if any of you ever heard of Arletti. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, she was sort of the, she was the Greta Garbo um, of the, the sort of years, the third, late 30s, 40s, then of course there's a kind of a, a bit of a hiatus, and then in the 50s. And um, she was uh, stunning looking, um, despite the hat. <laughs> um, had a great singing voice, had charisma, uh, someone who was, uh, you know, destined, I suppose, to represent uh, France. <laughs> and, of course, she is not going to go down the same road as our little frumpy friend, um, all the same, or be forgotten the way Rose Vallon uh, has been forgotten. All right, now she also comes from a very poor family, um, but makes her way up um, through, this, learns to type, and becomes a sort of a typist, you know, through mixing here and there and being very good looking, has taken to nightclubs and meets people, and so finally gets on the stage herself through cabarets and so on. I just want to do, give you the example again, of coming back to this film, of course, she's exactly the example of what, uh, you know, Vichy was um, against. She's someone who does all of these things, you know, and does none of those, but this doesn't seem to matter. And at the time, it doesn't matter. But the problem for me is it doesn't matter anymore. You know, she is the star, um, a fated star of French cinema, considered one of the greatest French actresses of all time, you know. All right, so she starts out her career with Poiré. I don't know if you remember Poiré. We were talking about him last week. Um, we're talking about Chanel. Remember Poiré was the, one of the first people to get rid of the corset. It wasn't uh, Chanel. Wonderful art deco. So she was so beautiful, as you can see, with the, um, the wonderful art deco type. Uh, design and she then makes um, uh, a name for herself um, as being this tough talking um, Parisian who knows for Parisian slang and uh, the, there's been a number of sort of trying to explain why she was so popular is that she sort of represents a kind of continuity um, of uh, the idea of the true Parisian and in a time when everything else was changing. She was a kind of Parisian Marianne and people felt comfortable with this tough woman. Now she was never actually, up until the end of the war, she wasn't in the main role. She was usually, she was usually a prostitute or, or a tough singer or something. Now, um, and she, she was a singer as well. I mean, she could do it all. Now, um, look, these are famous, famous French films that she's in, and the French, with great nostalgia, always look at, back at the Hôtel du Nord, and um, I want to look at the people she um, works with. You have um, Louis Jouvet, these are the great actors of the time, Hôtel du Nord, and then in 1939, she um, stars in a film 
uh, usual celeb daybreak, but with Marcel Catney. And look, I know it's not going to mean a lot to you, but he was he was a <coughs> well, we'll talk about his role in a moment. But the scenario is written by Prévert. Do you, do you know Prévert? You must have done him at school or university, you know, very simple poems. No? No. no. no just we come, just we, just we think comes out. I mean, it, it's very simple um, poetic realism. So she's working with the greatest directors and the greatest scenarists. Now, Jean Gabin, right, um, an important person, is the star of the moment. He makes a choice when uh, the Germans come to, to, to Paris. Uh, he leaves. He goes to America. He ends up with de Gaulle uh, in, in England and will be part of the uh, army who liberates Paris. All right, so this is the difference that you get. Um, he'll be awarded the Legion of Honor and so on, in between having an early liaison with uh, Marina Dietrich, etc. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but he's, he's someone who stays true. So he, during the war, Jean Renoir, the son of the painter, uh, who is the great uh, director, he also goes into exile um, and other, other great actors. People make a decision. They can stay or they leave. And we're looking at one of the ones who stayed. All right, Marcel, uh, there's Jacques Prévert. You don't know anything about him, so I won't go on about him. All right, um, but it's worth, you know, if you're interested, read his poetry. Now, um, we now get to Paris um, during the occupation. Um, this is this Paris, which is this Disneyland where all of the French, the German soldiers come on leave. They have their little guidebooks. We saw the guidebooks to the different brothels and so on last week. Um, here we have the Rex Cinema, which is the cinema um, of Paris, and it can hold 2,700 people in its main hall. This is what cinemas were like. You know, it's not like going to the Lido and you're sitting with six people. All right. This, this is a massive place, and this was taken over uniquely for the, the German soldiers. All right. So this, these would be probably German films which would be there. Now, what happens during the war with the cinema? Well, several things. First of all, it's a very, very, just on a practical level before we get into anything else, it's a very, very cold winter. No one has any firewood and the cinemas are heated, right? So this is part of the propaganda. Um, and so people go in their thousands to be in this warmer environment. Um, many of these cinemas, oh, in fact, I'll have to talk to you about the Continental, sorry. Well, the, um, let's go back. Um, Goebbels, uh, the great propagandist, uh, had realised that you had to lull the Parisian population, uh, kind of an opium, um, into, not into submission, just keep them happy. You know, don't be outrightly difficult. The Germans had scorn for the French, even though they saw Paris as a creative hub. Uh, they had part, France had descended from the Franks, so therefore they had some Teutonic base, but they'd become degenerate. Right? And so um, basically you just had to keep them amused. How did you do this? You're going to do this by the cinema. And by now, um, Anglo-Saxon films were banned. So Hollywood films were banned. And Hollywood had already made huge in inroads into French cinema. French cinema really, at this time, was in disarray. So um, Goebbels then sees the chance. Uh, you can have a kind of a German-French cinema group, uh, which will be called the Continental. Uh, and huge sums of money are poured into this uh, enterprise. Um, first of all, they buy up or take many of the uh, production studios or the cinemas, which had belonged to Jewish families. They were just taken, of course, or bought the others out. So they were the, the Continental was the major cinema uh, environment in Paris uh, during the occupation. 
Uh, and as you can see, this is probably up on the boulevards, people um, flock um, to see these films. Now, the films were very, very carefully done, all right? They were, at the beginning, you went, you got in there, it was lovely and warm. Uh, you, uh, there was the document, not the documentary, the newsreel, do you remember those that you had? And that was mm -hmm. openly propaganda, okay? After that, you had the films which were produced by the Continental, which were um, in many ways fantasies, but also, even though they were filmed in Paris, made no reference to uh, German soldiers. There was no reference to what was happening with the Jews. There was no reference to anything to do with the war. So you had this kind of fantasy, warm world, um, of Parisian life as it used to be, because they're often um, placed in the past, um, where people could have a fantasy escape, feel warm and go home and think, well, you know, um, what have the Germans done for us? You know, it was a kind of um, a tragic Monty Python-esque situation. So Goebbels sets his man up, Goebbels, who lives at the Ritz, um, of course, uh, with all of our friends that we've been talking about. Here he is with some of his, his, his floozies. Um, a very clever man. Now, he's, he's sort of slightly ambiguous figure. He wanted, and the other thing that um, Goebbels wanted, he wanted um, quality cinema too. It didn't, it had to be shot beautifully, great sets, which you could afford with the amount of money. And he will then produce um, 30 films during this time, which is, which is the major production of films, the sort of golden age. Now, this is at a time when you also, the other thing that was vying with cinema was this um, exhibition, which is The Jew uh, and France. It's not Jews in France, it's The Jew. In other words, it's this concept of, of you know, how would you sort of say, the, a stereotype uh, with this ghastly image um, of a Jewish person, or probably the Rothschilds are represented, clawing um, the world towards themselves. Um, now, this was an exhibition which was put up and thousands and thousands of Parisians went to look at what a Jew looked like as well, how to recognise a Jew uh, in the street and so on. This is before, quite possibly before you had the yellow stars. Now, some of the um, work then that was done by the Continental, and one of them was the, the Raven. Um, I don't know if you've, you've seen that. It's worth going and having a look. It's probably on the internet. Um, it's basically about a, a story of denunciation, a psychiatrist, at least uh, people start receiving these letters denouncing them or denouncing their friends. And uh, it's a, a, a very, very dark story. Uh, and in the end, it was um, condemned basically by the left and the right and actually wasn't allowed to be shown after the liberation. But with Pierre Frenet, now he was the sort of male equivalent of, of, of um, Aleti, um, a collaborationist. So you have people then who, stars who don't have anywhere else, I suppose, to actually, you know, star, um, are brought in to this continental. And that's what Goebbels wants. He wants the main French stars to be seen in this German cinema, but also German, you know, we're pandering to the French. Now, Aleti, um, um, this is the kind of film that you then had um, basically during this time of the occupation. This is one Madame Saint-Jean, someone who was a, a laundress who ended up in the court of, of of, of Marie Louise with, with um, Napoleon, one of these silly comedies that the French don't do terribly well. Um, <laughs> but people loved it, you know. But and this is at a time when it was so life was so difficult, you know. You go for a total escape. Aleti, of course, um, stars in this. Um, she also stars in one which is even sillier. The Visiteur du Soir, this is the people who come visit in the evening. This is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, I read the plot. You've got two people who are being sent by the devil um, to break up a relationship, and then they fall in love with the people that they were actually supposed to be breaking up, and then the devil falls in love with the person who was in the throne, and then the, people who, the two people who were sent deny the devil, 
and are killed and their hearts beat together underneath the tombstone and the devil walks on. Now, what the French have done with this, and this was directed by Cahame, um, is say, oh, this, the people who were starring in this knew that they were giving an anti-German um, message, you know, the devil's really Hitler, and the two people whose hearts continued to beat beyond the grave is the true France. And the ridiculous thing is that Marcel Carné, who was the director right until his death, on his deathbed, is saying, no, that's not what I, I was doing at all. There was no symbolism in it at all. I was just trying to... Um, to, you know, write an escape movie, but that's not how it's gone down. Don't don't bother watching that one. <laughs> all right now, um, this is now considered as one of the greatest films of all time. This is the Les Enfants du Paradis, um, the Children of the Gods, and the Paradis are people who actually couldn't pay for for um, good seats, and so you sit right up um, above. And this stars Arletti as the love interest of four different uh, men. I won't go into the plot, but one of the people who actually stars in this, this is in 1945, is the brother of Jean Renet, right? So uh, Renoir, the, the painter, had three children. One who is the director, who goes into exile, his brother is an actor and stays. Um, and this is, you know, considered a, a great uh, film. Now, she actually, at this time, could, could not go to the premiere of the film. Now, why couldn't she? Um, apart from the fact that she'd been, uh, you know, living in the, the best places with uh, consorting with uh, the Continental, um, she'd fallen in love with, you know, this is a good story, isn't it? The same thing with, you know, um, um, a very sort of dashing uh, Luftwaffe uh, officer, who was stationed uh, in Paris. Now, she'd been introduced to him by none other than her best friend, uh, the daughter of Laval. Laval was the um, prime minister under uh, Pétain. So in other words, Aleti was already right in the middle of the Vichy government. And it's through them that she meets this dashing officer, 10 years younger than her, extraordinarily erudite. She, I think he'd been educated everywhere, spoke five languages, could recite Latin, you know, Ovid and so on. Um, and uh, they carry on a liaison for a number of years. Now, um, at the, there she is she, uh, with him. Uh, now, this is where they dine. She, with him, she, she lives at Pied de Conti. Uh, she frequents all the upper uh, echelons of the German uh, hierarchy, you know, very much like the, the Chanel situation while people are trying to get enough to eat. Um, this is her having um, a weekend. She obviously doesn't know how to ride, but, <laughs> but anyhow, she looks good. And um, this is, of course, what is going on uh, really in, in Paris. So all of this is just something that doesn't, doesn't happen. Uh, no, I'll, I'll come back to that. Now, what happens um, at, at, at Liberation? Well, what happens to him, first of all? They have an affair. He actually is demoted, um, which is quite interesting. He actually was... Um, working as the legal officer for the Luftwaffe um, in Paris. And at some stage, he is demoted, and I haven't been able to work out why. Um, from being a lieutenant colonel, um, he is sent off to fight at Monte Cassino, uh, sent off onto the front lines. Monte Cassino was one of the worst places to fight. My father and my first father-in-law fought at Monte Cassino. It was, it was a massacre. Um, and... Um, he survives, however. Um, their affair becomes more, less attenuated. There's passionate letters, and there's a book which has now been written because her letters have now been um, released. Um, he then marries a student or something and becomes the German ambassador to the Congo. And then, um, I know, and then dies actually one day with his family going for a swim and is eaten by a crocodile. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's a very colourful story, isn't it? So, what really interests us is what happens to Aleti. Well, when um, the uh, 
the Army Liberation Army comes in, of course, there are these reprisals. We saw what happened with women who are collaborationists last year, last week, uh, with their hair shaven, swastikas put on them, and they used to shave all their hair. I know there's a gentleman in the audience, but all of you know, you do have, it wasn't just the hair, hair of their head. Um, uh, you know, public humiliation. Well, this didn't happen to Arletti. She was actually taken, they did take her to Demancy, which is, you know, where people were placed when they were being interrogated. But uh, she she was released and she then uh, was told that she had to, for a couple of years, she wasn't just come within 80 miles of 80 kilometres of Paris. Mm -hmm. Um, but in actual fact, she then spent 18 months in, the, in a castle with a friend of hers uh, and then returned um, to being a great film star. She also then is, is considered uh, that she's advertising um, jewellery. Here she is advertising Lux soap, all right? In other words, you know, she is still the face of France. She was the richest actress at the time, incredibly wealthy. Um, and she even has Bruges actually styles uh, rather fashionable <laughs> shoes, I think. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Um, her films are actually translated into German and shown in German, Germany. But what really gets me is for the hundred years of cinema, all right, the hundred years of cinema, liberty, freedom, fraternity, hundred years, the hundred years of cinema, who do they put? All right, so there's this idea of, you know, the force of French creativity, you know, does not die, it lives on, it's sort of this total sort of amnesia um, of what went on. She, someone who profited immensely, even though she said, oh, look, I didn't really work for the Continental, you know, I refused some roles, but she works for Cahamé, who worked for the Continental and so on. In the end, trying to follow um, doing this research, and it drove me mad um, because everything is slightly, um, how would I put it, yeah, everything is slightly moved. You know, it's 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 like you know you know those um, psychological tests that you you can get where you have got a picture and they sort of say what do you see, um, and you can you can see two people kissing, or you can see a butterfly. Uh, it, it's all sort of done with shades and smoke and mirrors, and so it's very very difficult um, to find out what the truth is. Um, Anyway, we now get on to um, Edith. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I've gone over. Is that all right? All right. All right. I'm sorry. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. All right. We now get on to Edith Giovanna Gaston, um, known as Piat. Now, if ever anybody was uh, against what happened here, um, no children she had. You're not supposed to, of course, have any extra marital liaisons. She was a man eater. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I, I couldn't, there weren't enough slides for me to put all the, the men that she had relationships with. I just decided it wasn't worth it. So, I mean, this was completely against the, um, the ideas of the time. All right, so again, this is the legend, you know, the legend. She's, she's, we've actually got a plaque in Paris on these steps, on the steps of this house was born on the 19th of December in the greatest poverty, Edith Piaf, whose voice later would um, overcome the world. Right, okay, not true. <laughs> not true at all. No, this is where she's supposed to be. She's born in the hospital down the road, you know. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, it's terrific, isn't it? It's part of the legend, you know, this little, you know, la Morme, they call her the little girl. I'm sorry about this, but what a great... I've got a Piat fan here, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to go gently. <laughs> She's got a good voice. Okay, good. All, right. All right, so this is Belleville is, of course, the um, north east of Paris, which is the uh, working class and still the, the extreme working class part of Paris. If you ever go to Paris, um, go to Belleville. It's actually lovely. All right, so this is where she's born. She um she starts out. She's got a horrible life. I mean, she really does have a horrible life. Um, the mother abandons her. She's she's born into a family. Um, I think the father is um, 
French, but or, and with some kind of um, Italian background. And he's an acrobat, and the mother also works in the circus or something. And she's actually got some um, North African and Italian background as well. So she's very much a sort of a mixture. Um, she has a dreadful early life. I mean, she's abandoned by her, her mother um, and is sent then to actually live with her grandmother who uh, works in a, in a brothel uh, in, in, in the north of France. Uh, she grows up basically with uh, prostitutes um, around her. That's her family. She comes back to Paris um, really very, very young and uh, starts to sing. Um, on the pavement um, with um, a friend who probably was a, um, a illegitimate half sister. It's very, very, are these stories that you've got of these people, I and mean, they're very similar, aren't they? I mean, you know, look at look at uh, Chanel. Not, no one has succeeded like Chanel, mainly because Chanel ended up with this this big uh, Jewish family who were great finances. You know, basically, yeah. Um, anyway, so she, she makes her, you know, starts singing for practically nothing. She's brought into sort of prostitution and, and, and so on. Uh, she has a, an illegitimate child. Uh, she abandons the child or the child lives with the father and then the child dies at the age of two. Um, she then graduates a little bit and works in some of the singing in the brothels and things um, in Pigalle around there uh, and in many Montons. Uh, and is noticed, I'm sorry about this very grainy image, but it's the only image I can have of Germie, by this fellow, Louis Leclerc, who saw her on the street. This is, you know, one of these rags to, to, to you know, riches stories, uh, gives her 10 francs and says, um, come, um, I think I've got a place for you. And this is just round the corner from the Chateau Fontignac. Okay, mm -hmm. we've got some Chateau Frontignac people here. It's, it's in the Rue Pierre Charon, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so that's where it is. So it's just off the Jean's of Visée. The people are, you know, can't believe that he's going to put this girl on. Um, he changes her name um, for Piaf, means like little sparrow, um, because she's so short, she's four foot eight or something. She's very, very small. Uh, and uh, gets her to dress in black, you know, and that becomes what she will wear for forever. And uh, she has such an extraordinary voice um, that she is a triumph. And so from then on, she um, becomes a celebrity. She then, she is extremely important, uh, really, for French soul. There is absolutely no doubt about that. I, not, I'm not taking anything away from her. Uh, at all. What I'm looking at is the way which she, she, her legend has become part of the French legend. That's what this series is about, not about the person. She um, has a first marriage and her witness is uh, Marlene Dietrich. She then proceeds into a series um, of liaisons with men. Now, the reason I've actually, this is one of the many, but um, he actually then becomes one of the um, actors who works with the Continental, you know what I mean? So that's why I have him there. Um, she, um, through now, through her liaisons with um, the upper class, she meets the literary people. And this is Jean Cocteau. Um, I don't, do you know Jean Cocteau? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. All right, who's a cineast, but, you know, extraordinary sort of man. And he actually writes for her, Le Bain Indifférent. And I don't think people know that she actually acted in this. Uh, she, and here he is actually sort of coaching her. So she wasn't just a singer, she could perform as well. Now, um, we get to the time um, of the uh, uh, occupation, and she is in full swing. I mean, she is probably the, would collaborate in the real sense of the word, the most of virtually anyone we've known, with the exception of, 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 of uh, Coco Chanel, who, who works for the Germans. She, um, I've actually, this is a, a brothel, would you believe, or Belle Poulou. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, and the brothels, of course, Paris was famous for its, its brothels, its upmarket brothels. And she, by now, would actually perform, not like this, she'd actually sing uh, in them. You'd have all of the top German brass, of course, would be in the, these brothels. Um, and in particular, this I couldn't get a picture of the one that she worked for the most, the, the L'Etoile de Clébert, which is 
um, closed down, would you believe? Um, but um, it was just around the street from the Rue Lauristan. Now, the Rue Lauristan in Paris uh, was known as the Street of Horror. Um, it had two buildings, one which had the Gestapo and the other with the uh, this group of, uh, what were they called? The uh, Cagnari, it's, it's a, a, a name for the French Gestapo. And here we have a plaque. This is in homage to the residents who were tortured in this house from 1940 to 1944 by the French auxiliary agents of the Gestapo. And the group was known as the Bonnie Lafon. But this was an extreme group of the Melites. Now, the Gestapo basically turned over most of their torturing and rounding up of, of Jews, of, of immigrants, and so on to the French themselves. And in fact, um, there was very little, apart from orders that, that might have come out from Germany, that was all that was needed. The French did absolutely everything else. This would be where Jean Moulin would be tortured and, and, and would die. Um, it, it was the place of horror. And the people, the top brass who were working there, would come around the corner and uh, uh, Edith Piaf actually lived around the corner, had the top. Um, apartment in, in a building and would entertain um, these friends uh, of, um, she had a friend who was having a liaison with one of these uh, top torturers. So, you know, she, she was very well aware. It wasn't just sort of eating at the Ritz and seeing people looking through the garbage. This was real blocking out of what was going on around you for your own interests. Um, I found it very hard to find any visual images of Piaf because she has become, of course, you know, this image of France during the war. And if you actually look up any articles on her, you know, click Piaf war or something, you get these diatribes. She saved so many, you know, she worked for the resistance. She saved people. It's absolutely, it's totally untrue. Um, she actually went to the extent of actually going on tour in Germany uh, to sing there, probably for the Germans, for the Germans, but also on one occasion she sang for the, the French prisoners. And this is photo of her, which was really difficult when, of course, liberation comes and people were saying, well, who collaborated? And she had a friend who was called himself a resistor, you know, there's then the resistance of the capital R, the resistance of the small R. Anyway, he was someone and he said, no, 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 no. She was there. There's no doubt about that. But she was clever enough to have herself photographed with these people, which meant that we could then make identity cards with these people and liberate 150 so, so people from the camp. There's no evidence whatsoever that this ever happened, all right? So it was a total whitewashing of her. One little image that I did have of her when she was singing in Paris was this one here, um, being congratulated uh, by the Germans. Someone else who actually is a bit dicey is uh, Maurice, uh, Maurice Chevalier. Yeah, this, I, I won't go into him, but he's another one. Um, anyhow, let's quickly get back to her. Well, she was very influential with the next generation of singers. She has, she meets these people and immediately has a liaison with them. You know, it's sort of the energy of the woman sort of amazes me. I would have had one with my child. <laughs> <laughs> there was, but I think a lot of people did actually. <laughs> Quite interesting is that um, she seems to go to far, people of foreign backgrounds. So even Montan, of course, is Italian. Um, he was still going on his 80s, and so he just had a child. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's right. Anyway, great, great singer. All right, so that lasts for a while. He doesn't actually doesn't actually have a. I don't think she had an affair with him, but she influences him. Now, what happens is that she um, probably as a relative result of her background and um, she leads a very dangerous life of, of over drinking and so on she has a number of car accidents um, one of which is with uh, Asna Rua, who of course is Armenian this is what I thought was it's really interesting they're all years younger than her you know um, I suppose it's a good idea and um, 
she uh, doesn't heal properly and ends up uh, becoming a morphine addict. But I mean, who else was a morphine addict? Do you remember Al Coco? Yes. All right, now the love of her life. I mean, it's all the person who's always loving you life in these stories is the fellow who dies, mainly because he dies before he became a bore. Um, <laughs> he's, um, he's, he's a boxer, for God's sake. No, and he's a boxer from North Africa. I can imagine the conversation. Yeah. Yes. How's, how's your uppercut today, dear? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So he's a, he's a little white world champion. Uh, and uh, he does, uh, notwithstanding the fact he had a wife and three children at the time, you know, but he's been had it's, it's a tragic story. It's a tragic story. You probably know it, don't you? Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, he was on his way to meet her in New York because she was on a triumphant uh, tour of, of, of New York and uh, the, the plane goes down. Oh, you know? no. uh, and the entire, but there was a famous violinist who actually died in the thing as well, but no one's bothered with anything about her. So there's Marcel. Um, he also was a bit younger. Um, and so she then also becomes uh, with George Mustaki. Do you know? You know, he was a great sort of singer in the seventies, wasn't it? The eighties. He was, I think, ten, he's only ten years younger. This one. Um, he was again Greek, uh, brought up in in Alexandria. He's a Greek, Italian, French background. So she is influence on him. And her final person is, of course, or the final husband. She actually only marries twice, which is quite amazing. But she probably didn't have time to get to the office with the others. He's this, this Theo Shapiro, who's also Greek, as you can see, is 20 years younger than her, which I really think is pushing him a bit. Um, <laughs> all right. But he's the second, second husband. And uh, she uh, dies very, very young. She uh, dies when she's, what did I say, 47, 48. Um, as a result um, of, she had a huge number of, of, of illnesses. She, she had some kind of arthritis at 48, uh, possibly because of malnourishment as a child. She, um, the morphine, the different drugs, al alcoholism, um, number of accidents that she'd been, I think she'd been in three car accidents, which makes you sort of wonder a bit. I mean, I'm a hopeless driver, but I mean, I haven't done that yet. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so she must have been living being fast people anyway. So, but she does good things, for example, the Olympia, which is, you know, on the boulevards, which is the place for, for singers, um, was going to have to close for lack of funds. And so this very famous woman um, decides that she will come um, and sing. And this is probably one of her very, very last performances. Now, when you look at her, she does not look 48. Uh, she looks extremely old. All right. So um, I just... Now, want to. Um, this is where she's buried in Père Lachaise Cemetery. I think some of us have been there. Um, very attractive when she's she's younger. Um, I don't know where, again whether it's done with a lot of light and mirrors, but I want to actually play to you um, a song, her famous song, which I think exemplifies this whole series. Michel Bouquet, celui de Charles Dumont, non, je ne regrette rien. Now she was so high on morphine, she could hardly stand up. She looks so safe, doesn't she? Non, je ne regrette rien. Sorry, I just want to, we could be here for a while. <laughs> no, no, je ne rêve rien. Yeah, I think this is very much, yeah, yeah. I don't regret anything. Yeah. Neither bien, neither mal, the good or the bad. Mm -hmm. It's all equal to me. 
je m'en fous du passé. I can give a excuse it, shit about the past. Mm -hmm. All right. And I think this exemplifies um, the lives that these sort of women led. And we, whether we judge them or not is, is irrelevant. What is important, I think, is that they have all become symbols of, of France. Mm -hmm. This ongoing idea that the French genius lives on, that it was never subdued or perverted in any way by this presence during the war. And in fact, it is only in 1995 that Jacques Chirac um, stands up and apologizes for what happened to the Jews and what happened during the occupation. And this idea that all of the France, all of France were resistance existed in this sort of hiatus up until then. And it's only now that you're getting other people interned in the pantheon, uh, resistors, real resistors being interned. But I thought that song exemplified it all. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I hope you've enjoyed this series. Oh. <laughs>